It's March 2021, so about a year has passed since the first quarantine here in the area of Cluj in the middle of Transylvania. So I made this video, which is different from the other ones on the channel, perhaps more personal. It has two parts. The first one was filmed on this trail a year ago when there was no snow like now. I tried to give some advice about the difficult period to come, how to manage staying in your homes and uh, how not to go crazy during that. And I also took some guesses about how the pandemic will go. It can be interesting to see where I was right and where I was wrong. The second part was filmed in May, the first time I got the opportunity to go out in nature after two months of quarantine. I spoke about the conditions of the quarantine here in Transylvania and what were my personal difficulties and about how well I took my own advice. After that, we had the opportunity to hike more often in 2020, about which you can find the video here on the channel. From tomorrow, there's a state of emergency in the whole country, so we decided to take a walk in nature for the last time. Because we don't know what's next, they could limit free movement. A little bit later I will make some predictions about what's coming. But before anybody would go crazy, I live 10 minutes from here. We got into the car, came here directly and haven't met anybody. So we won't infect anybody and nobody will infect us. I thought I will give my two cents on the subject, because everybody seems to do that anyway. My first observation is that there are four groups of people in this situation. Those who are panicking, those who are taking it lightly, conspiration theorists and the rest of us who are trying to make it through it with a clear mind. I have a message for each group. Let's start with those who are taking it lightly because they seem to be the majority. For instance, they like to compare COVID-19 to the regular flu. I'm a science guy, so I like to give counter arguments based on numbers. For instance, the death rate for the regular flu is around 0.1%. Right now, for COVID-19, it's around 5%. That's one consideration. The second one is the percentage of people who need hospitalized care. Because that's the main stake. That's what we should understand, that even if we are young and healthy, and we are not in imminent danger and could get just a bad flu. We've kept the distance with the runner. The stake is not to get other people sick in the first phase. Keep healthy the elderly and the sick because for them it poses a real danger. And the second stake is not to overload the hospitals because I may be healthy and asymptomatic from COVID but I could infect other people who get into the hospital and because of those hospitals get full and if I get into a car accident nobody will be able to take care of me because doctors will need to take care of those that I have infected. So even if we love to be individualists, this time we need to think of the common good because it will reflect back on us if we don't. Not to mention the economical burden it will place on the country, which will also reflect back on us. If we infect less people, the economical effect will be smaller. So we need to consider these things as well. There are several other comparisons, for instance to the swine flu epidemic or to Ebola. These are different kinds of viruses. For instance, for the swine flu we already have a vaccine, for COVID we don't. Ebola became contagious only when patients had clear signs of infection. The trick with COVID is that we can infect other people even if we don't have symptoms. That's the reason it can spread so quickly. So from this point of view, it's more dangerous than the regular flu and also more dangerous than the other viruses I've mentioned. I guess everybody is familiar with those pictures from 1918, from the time of the Spanish flu pandemic when huge buildings were full of beds. I don't know about you, but even for me those pictures are really horrific. So this was the message for those who take it lightly. For those who are panicking, I say this. Those 5% I've mentioned are calculated among persons who've been tested positive. So it's reasonable to think that a lot of people are infected 
but because they don't have symptoms, they are not tested. If they were tested, the percentage would be lower. Another consideration is that there's a good chance that a less aggressive mutation of the virus will appear, and that's the one that will spread. The reason for this is that those who are sick with the more aggressive version will have to stay in bed, and this way the virus will practically isolate itself. So in time, the less aggressive version will become predominant. And of course, panic doesn't solve anything. So please, I beg you, stop buying all the toilet paper. And all the hand sanitizer, the rice, pasta, and what else? Oh yeah, the flour, the oil, and the yeast. Because what will happen is that all the flour will fall on you from the storage closet. But we won't run out of food. The country is capable of producing enough food for us to survive. For the fans of conspiration theories and fake news, I have seen a lot of stuff out there. Starting with our favorite, that with warm water you can wash down the virus into your stomach and the acid will kill it. If this idea would have come from an average Joe, I would not say a thing. But there's a video of a supposed doctor from the States saying this. This theory is proved wrong by several other doctors on different websites. What happened is that when this fake news started circulating in the form of a list, it was attributed to Stanford. Since then, of course, they declared that it's not from them. So I assume that this supposed doctor have read that and considered it logical, so he didn't inform himself further. There's another version of this which is signed as a researcher from Wuhan, or his uncle is a researcher in Wuhan. Let's think about this for a minute. If a researcher discovers something, he will start to broadcast it on Facebook? No, it doesn't work that way. If a researcher discovers something, they have to publish it, so other researchers can verify it. That's how science works. So please stop believing in these dumb ideas. And have you heard that one that says that this is only a diversion and in fact the US army is coming to take Europe? My opinion is that if they want to come, they will come, because we are allies. Another favorite is that the virus is made by the Chinese. Or was it the Americans? Well, if it was made by Trump or by Soros, they did a really poor job, because their age group is the most endangered one. On the other hand, the real experts say that the virus is simply too good to be made in the lab, because a lab-made virus would be more aggressive and could not spread at this pace. Let's go to the fourth group, which is us, and hopefully you as well. Those who try to keep a clear and rational mind in this madness. In our case, I see two dangers. The first one is that we read so much news that we start to gravitate towards one of the other three groups. In this case, my advice is to try to think with our heads and not let our emotions influence us. The other danger is that persons from the other three groups are driving us nuts, which again brings us back to the emotional side. I can tell you, when I see a lot of dumbness or huge irresponsibility, the blood inside me starts to boil. Unfortunately, I believe that trying to convince these people and getting into these fights is in vain. Sometimes I have tried to write comments to my acquaintances about the numbers. Maybe it has some effect on some, because some people are just poorly informed, and in this case it's okay to have a discussion, but others are simply arrogant and ignorant, and they think that they know everything, and unfortunately in my experience, this is the majority in this country. In those cases, there's no point to lose your time and energy. Okay, so let's try to guess what's coming. Starting from Monday, the state of emergency will be declared in the country. The main reason for that is to make it easier to allocate money for the health services. Now I think the first word that comes into anyone's mind who lives here is corruption. 
So no, I don't think we will avoid it this time either, especially looking at the politicians who are busy playing power games even during the crisis. So probably some people will get rich after this, but let's forget about that. What else? I think it's useful to look at countries which are in front of us, so to say, where the virus has reached before us. So let's see what's happening in Italy and what isn't happening. What isn't happening is that grocery stores are not closing, so we don't have to be afraid of running out of food. This is a basic necessity of the population and I believe that even our government will provide it. Pharmacies are not closing either. We also have medicine producing companies, so the necessities can be provided by those. Now the problem is that some people are buying a lot of medication which is needed by those with chronic illnesses, such as those with cancer or diabetes. In this case, I don't really know what to say. This is extremely selfish. On the other hand, what is happening in Italy, and we can expect it, is that they will limit free movement. Speaking of which, I think that's the main reason we will have it worse than the Chinese, because they have that totalitarian system, and if they are told to stay at home, they are staying at home. In our case, we seem to make the exact opposite. So now in Italy, they have an online form, which you can download from the site of the government or the local authorities, and you have to write in your name, where are you going to, where are you going from, and what's your reason to do that. And the reason can be to buy food, to buy medicine, or to go to the doctor. And basically that's it. So going to a hike is not one of the options. So we have to prepare for this kind of restrictions, especially because no one is taking this seriously. And they go to the pub and they are gathering the same way as they did before. And by this, of course, they are just spreading the virus even more. The other interesting question is, when can we expect all of this? Regarding this, allow me a short mathematical argument. One of the favorite comparisons of the group who is taking it lightly is to compare the number of deaths caused by COVID and those caused by the regular flu or famine or car accidents. And they say something like, we only have 3000 deaths because of COVID. Now, the sad truth is that, as they say, this won't age well, because those 3000 are already 6000 and we have to understand what exponential growth means. That's an exponential function, so something to the power of x, which means that the number doubles, not increases by some amount. For instance, if we say that today we have 6000 deaths, and if the circumstances remain the same and we do no social distancing, then the number of cases is doubling in around 3 days. So if the number of cases is doubling and the mortality rate is fixed, then also the number of deaths will double. So if today we have 6000, then in 3 days we will have 12000. In 6 days we will have 24000. In 9 days we will have 84000. And in less than a month we will have a bigger number than any of those other numbers on these meme-like pictures. Normally, we were behind the Italians, taking into account the doubling rate by about 10 days, if I remember the statistics correctly. But our fellow compatriots gave us a helping hand with that. Several hundred thousands are coming back into the country. Now, out of those, how many are infected? Even if only just a few hundred, they practically shifted our curve forward. So, we will have the same curve, but much earlier. The problem with that is that the peak will also come faster and it won't have enough time to flatten and to ease the burden on the healthcare system. Another thing we need to understand is that we only know the official numbers, but the number of the true cases is significantly bigger. That's why we should be responsible. There are some interesting statistics about this. For instance, when the first death happens, there are around 800 real cases. The number of confirmed cases is of course dependent on the number of tests that were made. But right now, in Romania, we have around 120, 130. 
30 confirmed cases. In my opinion, the real number of cases is around 10,000. Even if we only have a single confirmed case in Cluj, the city where we live in, I'm working from home since Wednesday, and when I go out, I disinfect every door handle I put my hand on. My keys, by the way, we have to be really careful with cash, because that was one of the most contagious things in China, and also I sanitize my hands frequently. Luckily, because I use it for hiking, I had some small hand sanitizers at home. Even if the shops are out of stock, I'm still fine for some amount of time. We will soon arrive to a meadow, and I'm curious how much distance people are keeping among each other. Obviously, a lot of people know that from tomorrow there's a lockdown, and it's also a beautiful sunny day today, the 15th of March. There are a lot of people working out today. Of course, families are staying in a group, but groups seem to keep a bigger distance between each other. quite few people here actually. So let's see what we can do taking into consideration what we expect to come. As we have said, stop emptying half of the grocery store, because first of all it will be full again the next day. Second of all, what do you want to do with 50 cans of corn? Or what do you want to do with 50 kilograms of flour? Please explain that to me. In the worst case, let's be prepared that we get sick and we have to stay two weeks in the house, so we could stack up food for about two weeks, especially if we don't have someone to help us with that. Food and other necessities, such as soap. For instance, I usually do my groceries twice a week, but now I've stacked up for a week and a half. There's no reason to fill up three big grocery carts. We must prepare for staying in our homes for a long period of time. This will be more difficult for extroverts. They will feel a strong need for social connections. I can relate to both sides because I'm an ambivert, so I don't really like staying too much alone, but I will be fine. My suggestion for you is to speak with each other on Skype or on the phone. Let's use the technology so we don't feel so lonely. So this is an important thing for which we must prepare mentally to keep our mental health. We should try avoiding being lazy and watching TV shows all day, even if it looks like an attractive option. After some time, we will feel a remorse that we are not productive. Everybody has something to do, some of us can work from home, others can study, like the students and high school pupils, but there will be some who won't be able to do their jobs from home, and the temptation will be the biggest in their case. I would suggest to make a promise to yourself that every day you will do something productive for half an hour or for an hour. If you can't do your job, then read something or make something creative. But try to avoid this lazy spiral of doing nothing because it will also have bad consequences on our mental health. So that's what I wanted to say about the mental part, but there's also the physical one. Don't sit at the computer the whole day. Try to come up with some simple exercises that you can do at home, such as squats, push-ups. If you are not strong enough to do a regular push-up, you can do knee push-ups or wall push-ups. You could do jumping jacks, rotating your hands around, anything. Especially us, who like hiking, we need to stay in good condition so we can climb the mountains and because probably we have a bigger need to get out into nature, it will be more difficult for us. That's why we came out today, but we have to hang on somehow for our sake and for the sake of others. So don't forget to move around, because too much sitting can also cause serious problems. I think that's all. Take care of yourself and stay healthy. Bye!
It's the 18th of May and the government started relaxing the restrictions three days ago. I want to tell you about the measures that were in place in Transylvania and how we managed the isolation in the past two months. I will enumerate the three most difficult things for me in this period and you will find out how many times I've met my girlfriend in the past two months. Yes, that's my corona hair. So it's a Monday and in a few hours I have to work, but I felt that I must go out because my head was exploding. So in the past two months it was state of emergency in the whole country, which meant the limitation of some fundamental rights. One of those is the right to move freely, which meant that every time we left the house we had to complete a form about the reason we are leaving, our destination and between what hours we will be gone. The police could stop you at any time and fine you if you did not have the form with you or it wasn't correctly completed. In the whole Europe, the most fines and the biggest ones were applied in Romania. The minimum fine was 2000 lei, which is one and a half times the minimum monthly wage or about two thirds from the medium monthly wage. So because of the huge fines, and rumors about the police applying them abusively, we left the house only for strict necessities. I've left the house about once a week. Because we don't live together with Edit, and it's not in the way to any shop, we haven't met a single time during the two months. So for me, this was the most difficult thing, that I could keep in touch with my girlfriend only via video calls in these two months. The second biggest hurdle was the fact that the amount of work has increased significantly due to the fact that it had to be done online. Because of this I've been working 12 hours a day on average and I'm still a little bit behind. So of course this has meant a lot of stress and it will go on like this for at least two more weeks. And the third most difficult thing was that I couldn't go out in nature, I couldn't do some intense workouts. Because according to the rules, individual sport activities were only allowed in the proximity of your home. And because I live among flats, I skipped running on concrete. So I prefer to work out at home, and of course a good question is how well I've taken my own advice. Obviously not 100%, I didn't do intense workouts, I've just lifted some weights, or exercised with bands when I took a break, because I had a lot of work, I didn't have any problems in feeling productive, but the priorities were difficult to respect, especially the healthy nutrition, which you can see on my belly. Because I did my groceries once a week, I avoided buying food which goes bad quickly, I've bought fresh food for maybe a couple of days, and in general the rest is less healthy, and makes you fat more easily. If the quarantine is over for you as well, which were the three most difficult things for you? Or if it's not over yet, which are your biggest hurdles? Leave me a comment, I'm interested. Maybe there were some positive sides as well? Which are those? For me, a positive side was that the city was more silent, pollution went down, the usual constant running disappeared, which I tend to avoid anyway in my everyday life, for instance by going out into the nature. I hope you liked this video, if so, give me a like and subscribe. I have plans for videos from Norway, Iceland and of course Transylvania. I have unedited footage from Fagarash Mountains from Piatra Krajului and of course from Madeira, from where we have returned just before the lockdown. Take care, even if the restrictions are less severe now, the pandemic is not over yet. See you later.